So as James mentioned, uh, I'm a soil microbiologist. I work in Chagas and Johnson Castle. Um, Johnson Castle is the Soils and Environmental Research Centre in Chagas. We focus on five main areas. We focus on soil fertility, uh, biodiversity, water quality, um, gaseous emissions, and soils. And actually, there's an extremely long legacy of soil research in Johnson Castle, coming back from the 1945 when the first research centre was uh, established there. So, so while there's been a long uh, legacy of soils research in, in Chagas and in, in Johnson Castle, um, I suppose a lot of the expertise has always been in the physical and the chemical sides of, of the discipline. But what's becoming more apparent uh, within recent years is um, the idea that if we really want to understand soils, if we really want to understand soil processes, we need to go beyond the traditional disciplines and look about how these integrate, these traditional disciplines integrate with the soil biology, which in many cases are the engines of the whole system. So with this in mind, um, I suppose there's been quite a, a change and a more of an emphasis on the soil biology and Chagas over the last number of years have been investing strongly in this area and the soil microbiome, the microbiology of soils, the microbiology of plants has become one of the, the priority areas within Chagas. So they've been investing in personnel, in infrastructure and in research in this area. And about two years ago, just, just shy of two years ago, a new uh, sub-programme was started, uh, which I'm responsible for. So it focuses um, on soil and environmental microbiology. So about two years ago, it was me, myself and I, but Chagas has now appointed two personnel on, permanent personnel on this, and myself and Aoife Duff, who's a technologist uh, in Johnstown. And although we're still very, very new, we've been expanding rather rapidly, and our research group now looks like this. So we've quite a big group already, and we've more recruits coming in uh, early next year. So what we're working on is a whole range of topics. Um, a lot of them focus on the soil and plant microbiology. Um, mitigating greenhouse gases is a big area of research for us. Um, we're also working on indicators of soil quality, uh, soil functioning, and how agriculture and the environment impacts on these. We're working on enteric pathogens, E. coli, salmonella, organisms that cause disease in humans, and the impact of agricultural practices on these, such as land spreading. And we're also uh, focused on the microbes that drive nutrient cycling. So if we take a step back and think about the grand challenges for agriculture and, and indeed for society, right up at the top of them is this growing population of mouths to feed, heading towards 9, 10 billion people, all needing to be fed, means that food production is of critical importance in terms of, of uh, moving forward. This has to be done in the context of rising fertilizer ener energy costs. But importantly, we need to farm in a way now that reduces greenhouse gas emissions. Greenhouse gas emissions have doubled in the last 50 years, and probably greenhouse gas is one of the foremost challenges facing agriculture or Irish agriculture into the future. So we need to f produce food, but we also need to manage our uh, agronomic practices in a way that means that we're not damaging the environment, that we're safeguarding our soils, our waters, our biodiversity, and our air quality. And all of this, as if that wasn't enough, has to be done within the context of uh, increasingly unpredictable climate. And I suppose after last year, we need to talk to anybody about that, um, that it's important that not only are these agronomic systems producing food of high quality and quantity, but also those agricultural systems need to be evaluated by how resilient they are to these uh, climatic extremes which are going to become more prevalent. And for me, uh, talking about all these challenges um, and the solutions to these challenges, soil is at the very heart of everything. And for those of us who are custodians of soils, be that half an acre or 100,000 acres, there's a real responsibility for all of us to manage soils in a way that we pass them on to future generations in, in, a, in a state that's either equal or better than we receive them. But if we look on a global basis at soils, actually globally soils are in a bit of bother. Um, soil quality is of huge concern globally. Um, soil is itself, um, 
not a renewable source in human lifetimes. At the moment, we're degrading soil much faster than it can be regenerated. Um, in, in the case of the USA, this is 10 times, they're degrading it 10 times faster than it can be replaced. And in China, it's 40 times. 24 billion tons of topsoil is being lost every single year. And that's soil that can't, can't be easily replaced. It's losing all of those functions associated with it. A recent FAO report from the UN suggests that 33% of so soils globally are moderately or highly degraded. And their prediction was we only had about 60 years of topsoil left. So there's, there's a lot of challenges facing globally and, and looking after soil quality. So what about Irish soils? What, what state are our, our soils in? Are we also in trouble or are we ticking away okay? And actually by international standards, our soils are probably in pretty good state. Um, but we shouldn't be complacent and we need ways of evaluating the impact of what we do on our soils and, and soil health. So if we think of soils, we might automatically think about uh, soils as being important for food production. But 95% of all our food comes from soils. But actually, uh, this is only one of a whole range of functions that soil provides for agriculture and also to the broader society. It, it sequesters carbon, for example. It filters our water, purifies our water. Um, it, it's a main, major driver of nutrient cycling, global nutrient cycling. Um, it's a huge store of biodiversity, which we'll get onto a bit later. It also provides chemicals that are important for society. For example, most of our antibiotics that are used in hospitals today, they all come from soils. So soils provide these huge round, range of functions. But what people often forget is that the majority of these functions for the soil are underpinned by the biology. And it's not just that the biology is living in soil, it's part of soil. This is what actually makes soil. If you strip out the biology, you lose most of the functions. So, talking about soil biota, what's in soil and what are they actually doing? Well, there's a whole diverse range of biota in soil, and I think Joel mentioned some of them. And they all have different scales and different, they do different jobs in soil. So they range from the very microscopic down to one or two microns, to millions of the meters, down at the smaller organisms that can only be really seen under the microscope. You're talking about your bacteria, your archaea, your fungi, and moving up to ones that are still very small, your nematodes and your protozoa. Then you move into what's called the mesofauna. This would be the calembola, acari, etc. And then further up, we have organisms that you could actually uh, see in your hand. Have a look at them. The earthworms, the ants, um, the woodlice, etc. And this, this diagram is often shown um, and often quoted. It's that, you know, to get an idea of the extent of organisms in soil, there are more organisms in a tablespoon of soil than there are people on the planet. So the, the diversity in soil is just mind blowing. It's a globally important reservoir in soil. We talk about the rainforests, etc., how important that they are for the ecology and the biodiversity. But soil between, contains between a third and a quarter of all organisms on the planet. Um, and actually, I often say to, to, to students, just to give them an idea of the stent, you know, if you pick up what you can fit in your fist, whatever soil you can put in there, you're talking about within there probably about 50 kilometers of microbial networks within that. You know, 100 million bacteria, you're talking 100,000 protozoa. Let's just give you an idea of the amount of life that's in soil. And, and that brings itself challenges in how to understand them. Despite the fact that we, of the amount of organisms and how important we know they are, we actually still know relatively little about the soil organisms. But thankfully, this is beginning to change. But what we do know is those abundance, the abundance and diversity of organisms in soil, they change with different soil types. They're not the same in every soil type, but we also know their impact on, they're impacted by management, which means it's really important how we manage our soils for soil biodiversity. So I'm gonna move on to the soil microbiome. So these are the microorganisms living in soil. So people often say, you know, why do you work on soil microbiology? It sounds a bit dull to me, but um, I often say 
come across this quote, which I think really gets across the meaning of why soil microbes are important. Um, it was in Nature Reviews and Microbiology, and it says, in a very simple way, why, why microbes are important. So the guy said, I make no apologies for putting microorganisms on a pedestal above all other living things. For if the last blue whale choked to death on the last panda, it would be disastrous, but not the end of the world. But if we accidentally poisoned the last two species of ammonia oxidizers that do just one part of the nitrogen cycle, that would be another matter. It would be game over, the end of life on the planet. And it finishes with this, it could be happening uh, right now, and we wouldn't even know it. So that for me gets across two things. One, how important soil microbiology is, and, and two, how little we actually know overall. So what do the or these organisms do in soil? Like Joel has gone through many of the functions, so I'm repeating here a little bit. But microbes in soil have both good and bad functions. So they have an active role in soil fertility. They're incredibly important in terms of uh, nitrogen fixation. You know, only certain uh, microorganisms are the only, only organisms on the planet that can naturally fix nitrogen. So they're the, the whole part of that link is solely dependent on microorganisms. They convert um, organic matter, complex forms of nutrients, into inorganic forms that can be used by nitrogen, or sorry, inorganic forms that can be used by plants and other organisms. Um, certain plants also increase the availability of nutrients. Uh, an example, Joel mentioned mycorrhiza. Mycorrhiza are unbelievably good at scavenging everything you could believe it. Uh, they, they supply phosphorus, for example, to plants in low phosphorus areas. They're incredibly good at mopping up and making available nutrients that plants can't get themselves. They also produce vitamins and plant hormones. But then on the bad side, um, we know that there's crop losses due to microbial uh, microbial um, attack of plants, if you like. And actually, it's estimated that between 20 and 40% of crops are lost due to pathogen pests and weeds. So the soil microorganisms uh, can influence crop responses to pathogens and to abiotic stress. Uh, crucially, they're, they're in intrinsically important for the establishment of the plant. In fact, there was a study done showing that soil organisms can alo alone can determine where a plant can uh, establish. So if you don't have the right microorganisms in the soil, which thankfully usually isn't uh, a problem, uh, your, your plant won't be able to establish at all from the very, very start. Um, it also prevents pathogen invasion. It stimulates plants' defenses. Um, and, and in general, species-rich uh, soil ecosystems are, tend to be more resilient and, and have a greater resistance and resilience to uh, stress and um, pathogen attack. But also, even though we know that the, the microbe can influence the crop, but equally, the crop and how we manage the soil influences the microbiome. So microbes are extremely adaptable. When you ch change their environment, they'll change either the composition or their activity. So everything we do to a soil impacts the, the organisms there and what they're doing. So for example, the vegetation. What crops you're growing? Is it a monoculture? Are you work looking at multiple crops? Uh, if you're cutting, um, this is affecting exudates. Everything we do in terms of managing crops affects, affects the microbiome. Uh, are we adding f uh, lime? Are we adding fertilizer? Um, what's the impact of soil structure? If we compact the field, we're reducing out those uh, air and water pores, the area is more likely to come anaerobic. So the organisms need to switch to more anaerobic metabolism. And also if you add contaminants, of course, that will affect the microbiome. In general, I mean, we're still trying to understand the effects of different management on the soil microbiome, but generally what's bad for soil is bad for the soil microbiome. If you degrade your soil, you're going to impact on the function of the microbiome. So why do we need to look at the microbiome? Well, I think, uh, well, Einstein said back in, the, in 1954, you know, we need a substantially new way of thinking if humanity is to survive. And I think that's as relevant today as it, it, it was back then. And certainly in terms of global uh, agriculture, 
systems are not fully sustainable. Uh, Joel mentioned, like for example, our efficiency in terms of fertilizers. We're losing a huge amount of fertilizers to environments. This isn't sustainable, so we do need to think about new ways of doing this to try and close those loops and reduce down losses and increase the efficiency of our systems. And this is where the microbiome, who are, who are I suppose, one of the main drivers of a lot of these processes, if we understand them better, we might be able to change our, our practices accordingly. So what, on a practical level, can, the, can research into the soil microbiome offer? So, so one thing that we we're working towards is seeing, can we manage soils in such a way to link soil functions to plant growth requirements? So we need nutrients, we need minerals for plants. Can we get the soil microbiome to work for us to deliver those? Um, you harness the national capacity of soil microbiome, the soil microbiome to provide those, but at the same time reduce environmentally damaging losses. Can we predict um, nutrient cycling in soil to better enable us to, uh, I suppose, uh, manage our soils, manage our inputs, um, and manage soils in a way to enhance biodiversity, at the same time trying to reduce greenhouse gases. So overall, to try and increase uh, agriculture, uh, agricultural and environmental sustainability. So there's been a huge amount of international activity in this area and a drive towards understanding the soil microbiome. These are just some examples. So for example, in 2011, um, the Soil Biodiversity Initiative was established. This was a global um, movement to try and bring together expertise on soil biology and to highlight it as an important area for research. Um, and as part of this, there's also been um, new publications, like really fantastic publications um, on Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas, and there's also a European version. And if any of you are interested in soil uh, biology, I encourage you to go on the website. These are free, freely available to download. So there's lots of really fantastic information in there to, to have a look at. Some other things nearer to home, for example, we hosted a conference in Cork um, there just last month, which is focused on microbiomes underpinning agriculture, looking at the microbiomes of plants, of soils and animals, and seeing how they can be, how we can gain knowledge from those to inform practices. And finally, just a plug that we ourselves in Johnson Castle will be having an open day in May next year. So if you are interested in soil, soil quality, soil biodiversity, you're very welcome to come down. So we know soil microbiome and soil biology is important, but how do we actually look at it? Uh, what are the tools that we can use? And the, the big challenge for it always has been for soil microbiologists is the sheer diversity um, and the phenomenal amount of organisms in soil. This has been a real challenge in terms of studying it. And also we've been very limited up until very recently by the techniques that have been available. So in the old days, what we might have done was try and pull organisms out of so soil, we might try and grow them on a petri dish to recreate their growth in the lab. Or we might stick them under the microscope and see if we can have a look. But the problem with both of them is that by both methods, we're only seeing a really tiny fraction of the overall community. So it's not that useful for telling us anything about the overall soil health. But new technologies have really changed this. And, and actually, there's been a complete revolution, if you like, in terms of how we look at the soil microbiome. New molecular techniques um, have enabled us to look at the whole community instead of just a little part of it. So uh, what we're, we're doing now is looking at different components of the biology. We can look at the DNA, which can tell us what organisms are there. So for example, I have different DNA to all of you. We're able to use that to tell us you know, what organisms are there and to identify them. We can further go and look at the RNA, another component, which can tell us what, are, what part of the community is actually active. So we know what's there. Are they actually active? Are they doing anything? Or are they maybe dead? And, and further down the line, uh, to look at the protein to show um, you know, what, what's actually going on there. Joel mentioned the enzymes were the, the machinery for everything. Enzymes are proteins. If we can actually look at the proteins, we have a good idea of what's actually happening in response to certain conditions. So the, the big benefits of these is we can look at the communities in situ. We don't have to pull them out into an artificial environment. We can look at them in their own environment. They're high throughput. We can go through a lot of samples in a, in a go. They're also decreasing rapidly in cost and increasing in accuracy. 
and they're mobile as well, which I'll get to back further. So overall, we get a much more comprehensive view of the, the community structure and what they're doing. And just to give you an idea how, how the technology has transformed, it used to be that a sequencer that gave you the code of the DNA would take a whole lab and, and it would be an absolute massive bit of kit. Now it's a little bit bigger than a USB uh, key. It's fit it in your hand, stick it into a laptop, and you have people, for example, are up in the North Pole sequencing. Or two years ago, the first ever sequencing in space was one, done with one of these instruments. So we may get to a stage not too far in the future where this might be something, a tool that you could have on the farm. So what are we doing? What, what research has been done in Ireland on, on soil environmental microbiology? I obviously can't go through all of our program here, but I just want to give you a few snippets, a little taster of what, what we're doing. So one of the areas that we're looking at is trying to predict soil organic mineralization. And Joel actually mentioned it, that uh, soil organic matter is the main pool of, of nutrients and minerals in soil. Even if you are adding fertilizer, this pool is providing a lot of what your plant and your biology needs. But unfortunately, uh, we have a very poor understanding of what form and when that soil organic matter will become available uh, to release all of those nutrients. So what we're trying to do in this work is try and understand what organisms are involved in, in mineralizing soil organic matter and when those nutrients will become available, under what conditions. And particularly looking at if you put in exudates from plants, how does this affect the soil organic matter mineralization with the aim of trying to come up with more specific fertilizer recommendations. The other thing uh, we're looking at is mixed species swords. Um, there's a lot of talk about uh, plant diversity. We, we have a, a colleague of ours, John Finn, who's been working on this area for quite a long, a long time, and Helen Sheridan there from UCD also. But looking at mixed species swords, moving beyond ryegrass to multiple species within grassland swords, and we have a trial running in Johnson Castle at the moment where we're looking at six species mixtures, uh, two grasses, two legumes, and two herbs. And we're looking at a yield and quality and, and quantity of herbage, but we're going beyond that to look and see how resilient are these systems to uh, stresses? Um, how, how, how does things like drought affect them? Um, and we had a good example actually this summer in terms of drought. Um, but we're also going a bit beyond that. What's the impact of mixed species swords on the microbiome? Do we get a much more diverse microbiome if we have greater above ground biodiversity? How does this impact processes like nitrogen cycling? And if you have a drought, uh, are the microbiomes that are more diverse from mixed species swords able to bounce back better, quicker after those stresses? And as I mentioned, greenhouse gases is one of the key elements we're looking at. It's a microbial process. In fact, most greenhouse gases from agriculture are actually microbial. Although cows get a lot of the, the blame for it, they're actually microbial processes. So the idea being, if we understand the microbes and the processes involved, we can better manage the systems. So um, we're looking at what organisms involved, what conditions that they will denitrify. And we're involved in an international study with partners across Europe and New Zealand, looking to see if we modify pH, if we get our farms into optimum pH, can we reduce nitrous oxide emissions? So these are a whole range of other things we work on and, and I won't have the time to go through them all, um, but we have a whole program of research focusing on the soil microbiome. One I might point out is uh, we have a new project on leather jackets and we have a student that's just about to start a two year national survey of leather jackets. So if you have leather jackets uh, problems on your farm and you want to be involved in that, give us a shout. We're going to be looking at interactions with the soil microbiome for that. So we've, we've talked about microbiome research that's on, ongoing, but back to the question I posed earlier on, what about Irish soils? What's been done on checking the quality of Irish soils? And this is a project I was actually not involved in myself, uh, but it was run and led out of Johnstown Castle by a colleague, David Wall, involving a range of uh, uh, collaborators across national and funded by the Department of Agriculture. And, and why I'm raising it is, it was the first inventory of soil quality in Ireland. This project's just come to a finish, so it's been running for four years. And it was looking at the physical, chemical, and biological quality of soils in Ireland. It was looking at soil functions across a whole range of different scales. 
It was a partnership of researchers, advisors and farmers and they looked at 160 sites all across Ireland, different soil drainage type, different land use, etc. to get a, a whole range of soils. I won't go through all the aims of it, but one of the, the, the things which I think was more, most important out of it was that one of the aims was to develop practical advice on soil management to maintain soil quality. And this was actually one of the outputs that they had from the project, which I think is hugely helpful. Um, it works on the visual assessment of soil quality, and the project team developed uh, a new method of visually assessing the quality of your soil. Now, this won't do everything, but it'll give you a very good idea of what your soil structure and physical, and probably some indications of what your biological quality is doing. And if any of you are interested in biology, I would, in, I would encourage you to give it a go. Um, we can provide the method to you. All you need is a spade, no other fancy tools, and it'll give you a really good idea of you know, what is the quality of your soil. And this is some of the other results that, that have come out, out of this project, just to give you an idea. Um, for example, we looked at microbial biomass across all these soil types and dividing the soil types into well-drained and poorly drained. And what they've essentially found is that on more well-drained soils, your microbial biodiversity or microbial biomass is lower, which we would expect because you have less clays and probably less organic matter. But when you increase the intensity of management, either increasing fertilizer or you increase mowing intensity, those soils, the more well-drained soils, are more resilient to management pressures. They're also looking at um, how drainage class and phosphorus uh, impact uh, microbial communities. And what they found is fungi and bacteria uh, respond differently to drainage and phosphorus. Um, bacterial communities are strongly impacted by pH. And this is something we know. pH is one of the major drivers of microbial communities, or the master variables, as we would call it. And particularly in low phosphorus soils, you get much more symbiotic fungi because they're using the best of those fungi to scavenge phosphorus, where phosphorus is low uh, for plants. So it's about the, getting the bioavailable pool uh, available for plants. So that's some of the research we're doing. And I've talked about some of the techniques we're using. But what about if I want to go out on my farm, I don't have access to sequencers, I just want to see, is my soil in good health? How do I go about doing that? But actually, first and foremost, I'd still advise, and there's a question earlier that indicated maybe it was limited to do that. I would still advise doing those traditional soil tests because without them, you're, you're stabbing in the dark. You have no, no idea where to put your nutrients, etc. So they may be limited, but they're still worth including. Visual indicators are really valuable. Go out, the soil is covered, but go out with a spade and have a look at the soil. You can tell a lot about the health of the soil. Use the, some of the, the available um, methods. Use vests or grass vests and, and work down through them and see where, where your, your soil score. But also visually assess. Go out, do you see earthworms? Do you see root mat? Do you see organic material in the soil? You can tell a lot about the health of the soil from just looking at it, and it doesn't require any specialist equipment. But we can also look at uh, indicators of function. For example, we can look at degradation capacity. Is your soil, is your slurry that's being put out, is it being degraded fast? That can tell you something about the health of your soil. There's also other methods where you can bury leaf litter, or you can bury certain types of tea bags, for example. Or you may have seen in farmers in Canada and America burying underwear and seeing how quickly they're chewed up by the microbiology. This can give you a very rough estimate of, is your biology active? Is it able to do this degradation function? Also things like drainage. Is there parts of your farm where drainage is impeded, where it wasn't before? This can tell you something that maybe there's some damage being done to the soil. Maybe you have compaction in areas along those tram lines or near, near um, the silage. Um, is the organic matter there? Is it being degraded? Are you having more fibrous stuff or is it more and more gone down to humus? This can tell you about what the soil organic matter is. And, and, and uh, Joel mentioned earlier, what's, what about the biomass? The quality and quantity. Are you having problems with your crops? Are you getting a lot of diseases, etc.? That can all be an indication that you maybe need to look at your soil biology. And, and my last slide then is this. I'll leave you with this thought. It's, we have extremely variable soil types in Ireland, more variable than many countries. 
you, I'm sure many of you would be able to tell me that you have more than one soil type on your farm and probably more than one soil type within a field. Add to that the whole range of parent materials we have. Add to that the climate, the rainfall, the slope. One size will not fit all in terms of management. We need to take into account the context. What works for you won't work for your neighbour or what works in one part of your field won't part work in the other. And this is a real challenge in terms of giving advice, in terms of fertiliser, in terms of farm management. And, 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 and this is the final thing, I suppose. We don't have all the answers. We don't have advice for every situation yet. We're trying to work towards it. But we don't have the answers, but we are at least asking the questions and hopefully move along towards answering some of them. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention.